13. Thank you, Josh, Martin, everybody. Um, so, new series, new series, all right, Doctrine, what we believe. Uh, so we're going to start this new series uh, titled Doctrine, and uh, and so we're going to jump into it. I'm, and I'm just going to tell you, I've told some people already this morning, to so just, just get ready today, and maybe for the next couple of weeks as we walk through this series, because uh, it may be like drinking from a fire hydrant, okay? Like just open up your mouth, insert a fire hydrant, and just swallow as fast as you can. Take in as much of this content, but there's so much here. And so what I want to do is kind of give you the realities of this and where these things come from biblically, because it matters what we believe. It matters what the scriptures teach us, and it matters what we believe about them. Uh, and so these are some big deals. But what I don't want this to be is a seminary class, okay? That's not what we're shooting for. Um, what we want to ask the question is, what do we believe and why does it matter? And so my, my goal at the end of every message is not only for you to have a good, robust, as well as we can in 40 to 50 minutes understanding of this doctrine uh, and what we believe about it, but also why it matters. Like, why does it matter to you sitting there today as you live out your life? Okay? So that's what we're shooting for. Now, we need to understand, first of all, as we jump into this, one of our core values is biblical authority, not one of our first core value. Because every other core value in our lives flows from biblical authority. All right, so around here, we believe this thing. All right, we believe it. All right, this is what we believe about it, is that less than it's a book, it's a library of books. Okay? And the thing about it is it's lots of these different books. Imagine a library walking in there, and you got all these books on the shelf. The difference about this library is that all the books on the shelf, they all come together, riff off of one another, and they tell one unifying story that finds its culmination, its apex, its beginning, its end, its everything in this person, Jesus. Okay? So that's what we believe about this book. All right? Just straight up front, get that, get that out of the way. That's what we're talking about. So that's why we're going to jump all over this book as we talk about these doctrines because we believe all of these things, all of these things are tied together and find their truth, their reality, their meaning in Jesus Christ, okay? Mark chapter 1. If you've got a Bible, flip over to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. We're going to be reading Mark chapter 1, 1 through 11. And then we're going to do what's known as Bible gymnastics, okay? We're going to be flipping all over this book. Okay, all over, all over this library, we're going to jump back and forth. So uh, Mark chapter 1, that's in the New Testament, um, so, you know, kind of, if you just open it up right in the center of the book, you'll probably land in Psalms, go to the right, and just keep going till you get to the New Testament, you'll find Matthew. Mark is the next book, and that's where we're going to be, chapter 1, okay? If you're there, say word. Word. Excellent. Let's get into the word so the word can get into us. Amen. All right, here we go. In the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, it is written in the uh, in Isaiah the prophet, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare you a way, a voice, one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make his path straight. John came baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming. You should notice a quick shift right there. So he's like, I'm going to tell you about Jesus. And then he goes back and talks about Isaiah. You're like, wow, we're going to get to that here in just a minute, okay? All right? And then he said, and then he goes to this guy. It's like, okay, we're about to hear this story about Jesus. And then he talks about John. I'm like, what's happening here, okay? There's a reason. All this is fitting together. We'll get to it. John came baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him. And they were baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. John wore a camel hair garment and a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. This was something else of a guy, okay? He proclaimed, one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. Uh oh, they should tune you back to Isaiah prophecy. I'm not worthy to stoop. Stoop down and untie the strap of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Let's go. He's getting to it. Now, verse 9. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized in the Jordan by John. As soon as he came up out of the water, he saw the heavens being torn open and a spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. We thank you. Lord, I pray that you just download this on our hearts. Let us understand it. Let us see the scriptures. Let us see the Old Testament, New Testament, how it all comes to this person, Jesus, and how it speaks to the divinity of Jesus, the deity of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Amen. So this is the deal. The first one in doctrine is uh, deity of Christ. So as we walk through this, um, I think there is a slide, but it's going to be uh, deity of Christ, original sin, um, uh, doctrine of the church, doctrine of the Trinity, doctrine of the resurrection, doctrine of the incarnation, doctrine of the new creation in Christ, and then doctrine of eschatology or end times. So you see that cleverly spells doctrine. <laughs> okay, I like that. Name. All right. All right, so that's where we're heading. Now you know. That's a blueprint for where we're heading over the next eight weeks. Uh, in between week two and week three, we will have a pause because I have a guest preacher here because I'm going on vacation, okay? And then we'll jump back into this. Sound good? That's where we're heading. Now, the question of deity of Christ, all right? So Jesus, uh, this is what you'll hear, okay? Jesus is a good first century rabbi, or, or is he something more? Uh, we talked about that. Jesus was a good first century rabbi. In fact, he was the best. He was the apex. He is the rabbi. Okay? All right? But some will just say, ah, he was, that's all he was. He was just a good first century rabbi, just a normal guy. You know, nothing, nothing, nothing to see here. Nothing to see here, just normal teacher. Okay? Yeah, Jesus was a good teacher, but is Jesus God? Lots of people ask that question. Is Jesus God? You know what? They'll say, God never, Jesus never says that in the scriptures. He never directly says, I am God. He never says that, okay? Uh -huh. And so they'll, they'll raise that question to you. Jesus, did Jesus ever claim to be divine? Divinity, deity. Did he ever do that? That's the question that people say. Uh, and other faiths, um, uh, even within semi-pseudo uh, biblical faiths that use the Bible, um, they even have a disagreement on the divinity of Jesus, okay? So what does it mean? What does it mean and is it? Uh, I've asked these questions in my own life, and I've had others ask me. And I'm sure you too have asked a question, okay? Uh, or at least thought about it. So, the other part of this is, okay, if Jesus is deity, if he is divine, is that what gave him the ability to do all these awesome things that we know he did and was able to accomplish and resurrect from the dead? And, and uh, it's really interesting, even within the Christian faith, we have like debate about this, okay? And and just this week, Josh sent me a um, a podcast between, and it was a discussion. Um, it was kind of like turned into like an internet like argument debate between two guys who I respect and honor the faith, Ken Ham and Dr. William Lane Craig, and they were arguing this reality of what does it mean for God to be deity, and how does all that work, and how does that Trinity and the incarnation, which is the humanity of Christ, and all that. So we're going to, listen, just suffice it to say, there's even debate among scholars on this, okay? All right, so here's, here's the thing. To answer this, and I don't pretend to have all the answers, okay? But I do have this word. I've studied a little bit, and I'm going to try to give you what I have and what God has shown me, okay? And to answer this question, what we have to do is interact with our inner Hebrew, as one, as one of my favorite theologians said. What you need to do is you need to put your inner Hebrew on all right, you're like, I don't have an inner Hebrew. That's why I'm here to help. Okay? I, I don't have a great one, but I'm, I'm developing it. I'm developing it, okay? Because this is the deal. This is stories of Hebrews put together by Hebrews, and they write in their context. Now, let me, let me help you, okay? All right, give me an example. I'll give you an example of how some of this works out, okay? Like, if you were to come to me as an eight-year-old, when I was eight years old, and said, hey, bro, take a selfie, I would have looked at you and been like, do what? Take a, take a what? What kind of chewing gum is that? I ain't never had that type of chewing gum, right? Because we didn't have framework for that word. We didn't have framework for that word. But now in our culture, in the way we, where we at, now you hear that, take a selfie, you're like, oh yeah, no problem. Oh, right? Alright? We wouldn't have any, let me give you another word, okay? Boom. So what just happened is, is when I said that, immediately things started firing off in your brain. You thought ghost, you thought scary, you thought Halloween, you thought maybe even remembered back to a time when your kids were dressed up for Halloween or had some sort of you know thing at, at the church and had a uh, fall festival because you didn't do Halloween because that's evil, whatever, right? Okay, all of those things went through your head, right? Now the younger generation, you know what went through their head? Boyfriend, girlfriend, potentially like side relationship that's not really your main one, whatever that means. Okay, so words take on all these different meanings and we use them and like when we say a word, like all of these memories and things and connections fire off in our brains about these. And guess what? It was no different for the Hebrews. Okay? No different for the Hebrews. Another word. Here we go. Alright? 
the last one I give you, just a, the other day, we were going to this coffee shop, and me and my wife, we ordered some coffee, and the girl was just really animated, character talking or whatever, and uh, we, we ordered it, and it was fun. It was a fun conversation over the uh, the ordering thing. I was just a menu, you know, and I heard her voice, all right? And we had a really good time with because she was really animated. And, uh, and you know, if, if you're up to date on, like, what's going on, I knew... As I was talking to this girl, that she was she was not wearing skinny jeans, um, she didn't use the laugh cry emoji, and she didn't have the side part. She had the middle part. If you know, you know. If you don't, you don't. Okay. So, okay. All right. So, all right, and this is what she said. We order our thing. We order our, our food, and, and and she was like, "Is that all?" And I was like, "Yes, ma'am. That's all. That's all I want." She said, "Bet." That's what she said to me. Bet. I was like. All right, so what was she said? What, what did she mean by that? What was she trying to tell me? Huh? Was she saying, this is a gamble. We're gambling now. That's what, this is a coffee shop, it's a gambling shop. Or was she just saying, you know, this is a friendly hypothesis, you know, like you do with a friend, like, I, I bet you can, I bet you can, you know, jump over that post. And then, you know, then you go, Somebody tries to jump over the post, typically guys, because you know, it's like, oh, no, but maybe I can do it, right? Is that what's happening? Is, that, is, she, is this a friendly hypothesis she just gave me? No. She's telling me it's a done deal. It's a done deal. Come on up to it. Get it. Come get it. Bet. All right, so words take on these meanings. And it's, it's true even in our culture. It's even true, believe it or not, for these guys in the Bible and women who, who uh, we hear their stories and read. Okay? I'm getting to a point. Get to a point. All right, one more example. Okay, all right. Me and my kids, Eleanor and JoJo, I got them laid down when they're little, and sing, we used to sing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. You're gonna sing it all the time. All right, it's gonna happen. Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. About to start singing that song. They are, and you sung it too, right, with your kids. All right, and then I'm sure you did this, because I did this, okay? This is the greatest example of this I've ever seen. You say, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, and instead of saying star, you say, Twinkle Twinkle Little Eleanor. Right? And so what did I just do? What was I doing? I was injecting Eleanor into the story to explain and, and let her know that she's a star. She's a star. And we do that. Right? Immediately, like everybody was like, oh yeah, yeah, I did that too. Like monkey. Or some song of that nature. Okay? Alright. The same types of things happen in the Hebrew Scriptures. I'm going to show you this, okay? So alright, are you ready? Like here's here's the part where we're going to start running. Alright? All right, we're going to start running. Okay, so the question is, what does any of this have to do with the deed of Jesus? And the answer is, is to this question. When people ask the question, is Jesus God? The Hebrew writers are giving us, and the New Testament writers are answering that question by saying that he is Lord. You're like, yep, it's the same word. Oh, well, it's not the word. What's happening here? God, Lord. Okay, here we go. What we need to do is create some Old Testament shell space. All right, so we're back in the library. All right, so imagine in your brain, I'm going to try to create some shelf space for you to organize some ways that the Bible talks about this. All right, in the Hebrew Bible, we have this, we have this name for God, which is, we pronounce it Yahweh, but we don't even know if that's actually the way it's pronounced, okay? We don't, we don't even really know a whole lot about this. We just know that this is his name. This is his covenant-keeping name with Israel. It's his special name with Israel, Okay. And so, what happens is, Genesis chapter 1, you have God creates all this stuff. And the word God there is this word Elohim. All right? so Elohim creates all this stuff. Then, you get to Genesis chapter 2. And now it's getting more specific, okay? Like the story is narrowing in. Our writer is narrowing in on some things. He's narrowing in specifically on humanity. And he wants to communicate what God is like towards humanity, okay? And this is what happens. So God all through chapter 1, which is the word Elohim, and then you have this. These are the records of the heavens and the earth concern, concerning their creation. Okay, At that time, the Lord God, the Lord God. So this is this word Yahweh, Okay, which we don't know how to pronounce it, but we just say it Yahweh now. It's Y-H-W-H is all that we really have about it. Okay, The Lord Elohim. So it's Yahweh Elohim is the word in the Hebrew. Yahweh Elohim. So Lord Elohim. God, Lord God, I'm getting somewhere. Just track with me. Help, just keep shelving this on this on your on your shelf, okay? Put these things in the shelf because I'm about to. It gets really wild how the how the Hebrew writers do this. And remember, remember, it's not like they had printing paper everywhere when they wrote this. 
They had like a small little bit and they put as much thought and intensity and importance on every word they put in their Bible. Because they didn't, they didn't have the luxury of like erasing or just throwing it out. They had to think about it very clearly. So what, what is happening here? What, what is happening is that um, the God, God, Elohim is a, is a word that all the cultures use for gods. And there was lots of God. People had lots of mentality for this. So it was like, if you would have heard Genesis chapter 1 and you were outside uh, Israel, you were some, you would be like, yeah, God created heavens and earth. I've never heard him created that way. That's interesting. But yeah, God. And you would have just thought you were God. But now you get to chapter 2 and it's like, boom, specific. No, it's Yahweh. This is the God of Israel. This is who we're talking about. There's a, there's a specific God that we're talking about. This is a specific God, okay? All right, so Yahweh Elohim. All right, then you go to Genesis chapter 24. Genesis chapter 24, okay? So I'm going to flip over there for you. Don't worry about it. I think we may even have this one on the screen. Genesis chapter 4, 24. And, and this is Abraham's servant, and this is what he says, okay? This is what Abraham's servant says about Abraham. He says, Lord God of my master, Abraham. Okay, so this is the way it translates. So Greek, okay, you're going to see Yahweh Elohim, Adon, or Adonai, Abraham. Then, and that's a Hebrew, I'm sorry. And then in the Greek, so there's this thing called the Septuagint, okay? And it's a, the Old Testament written in Hebrew, New Testament, New Testament mostly written in Greek, some of the Old Testament's in Aramaic, whatever, okay? But the point is they have the Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of the Old Testament, okay? So when you get to Jesus' day, mostly people are speaking Greek. Okay, so the, he, the, the New Testament writers write in Greek. So what they do is they, when they quote the Old Testament, they quote the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew text. We follow them? Everybody with me? Not lost? All right. All right. So this is how the Greek translates it. Kurios, Theos, the Kurios, Abraham. You see how, how confusing we're getting now. See, the word Yahweh and Adam, Adonai are the same word in the Greek. Same word, okay? Curious. Now we translate that, Lord God of my master Abraham. <laughs> now it gets even more confusing. So here's, here's where translation is just a struggle, okay? And why it's important. And it's good for us to go back to the Hebrew and try to understand these things. All right, my point in all of this that I'm trying to show you is that the, the New Testament writers, when they translated Yahweh, what they translated it to was Curious. Not Theos, which was Elohim. That's the word for Elohim. Theos, which is just God. They translated it curios. But they also translated this word Adon or Adonai of that too. Let me tell you why. Okay? Because they would not pronounce the word Yahweh. I told you they didn't know how to pronounce it. It was given to them as a special man. They considered it holy. Like it was like, you can't say it. You can't say it. So what they would do was they would write it. But when, when you would read this, or if you were reading a Hebrew text and you heard, if you heard it in Israelite in this day, reading a Hebrew text, they would see written. Yahweh, but they wouldn't pronounce Yahweh, they would pronounce Adonai. They just immediately in their head, they knew, I don't pronounce that, we just use Adonai for that. Okay? Now it gets even more confusing, right? All right? But remember, boom. All right? Halloween, all these things, and side relationships, right? Twinkle, twinkle, little star, this whole, like we do this with our language too. It's just foreign to us because we don't, we don't, we don't, most of us don't speak multiple languages, one, okay? But they do, all right? I'm getting somewhere. Please stick with me. Don't fall asleep. Just be here. This is cool. At least I think it's cool. You may be like, you're a nerd. And I'm like, yes, I'm a Bible nerd, card carrier, okay? All right. Okay. So, now some, so this is the reason I'm part, part, telling you this, okay? Is because this is the deal. Some people will say that the idea that Jesus is divine or the deity of Jesus is a New Testament concept. But it's not, Okay? We see in the Old Testament a concept, shelf space, for this multi-personal God. It's, it's, it's incredible how all this works and it ties together. I'll give you an example. Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 through 19, okay? And Abraham is with Sarah, okay? You're probably familiar with the story, but here's kind of what happens real quickly. These three men show up, and Abraham says, Abraham says, the Lord, Yahweh, shows up. So he says, three men showed up, but then he says, Yahweh showed up. So one of these men is Yahweh, but he's a man. How was he Yahweh? Because remember the Shema, which is the prayer that Israelites would pray every day? The Lord God is one. That's how it ends. The Lord God is one. But, so how can this man be Yahweh? How, what's happening here? And in fact, it calls him the angel of the Lord. 
So, it's, so even it gets more complex. And remember, this is just the Hebrew language and how how they're communicating things to us in their in their way of uh, literature. Okay, all right. So, it's, so hey, here's this angel of the Lord, and there's three men, and Yahweh is speaking every time one of the angel of the Lord speaks. He says it's Yahweh speaking, but yet it's so you have Yahweh, but yet it's distinct from Yahweh. It's it's this separate thing somehow, but yet it's it is Yahweh. So what the authors are trying to do is create shell space for us to understand that God is personal with us, and Yahweh is is He's this. Uh, well, what we would say we've got a pretty doctrine called the doctrine of Trinity. We'll talk about that later, okay? But all this suffices to say, okay. Now remember, back I've talked about this, but the Hebrews of this day they would they would be able to quote to you some of the the majority of them the entire first five books of the Bible. We ain't even left the first book yet. Okay, so when they're thinking these these New Testament writers, when they're thinking their their life is like is all the stories they know are the stories of the Old Testament, and so when they talk about things, it's just ripping off the Old Testament. Okay, you tracking with me? All right, this happens again in Exodus chapter chapter three, uh, verse one. It's really this is really interesting. Uh, Exodus chapter three, verse one. So what happens here? Is uh, this is Moses before the burning bush, and he, he gets there and he says, uh, he says he fled, but uh, he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness um, and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. So this is the mountain of Elohim. Then the angel of the Lord, so this angel of Yahweh, shows up and appeared to him in a flame of a fire with a bush. As Moses looked, he saw and he goes up to it. Right? I must go up there and see what's going on. And when the Lord Yahweh so now you have the angel of the Lord, and now you have Yahweh speaking here to Moses. So you have this one, the angel of the Lord, and Yahweh the Lord, the angel of Yahweh, yet Yahweh is speaking. So it's this, it's this contrast. They're not confused. Hear me. This is not writers being like, I don't know, I don't, I don't know how to talk. No. They know he knows exactly what he's doing here. Remember, they're not just chucking parchment out. It's very intentional. He's trying to create space for these people to understand that, that God is is. One, yet he's also more than one in some in some sense. Okay? And then he goes on to say that word, I, I, I am the I am. This happens again in Joshua chapter 5. I'm not going to flip there. Joshua's about to go into, Joshua's about to go take over Jer uh, Jericho. And he walks up to look over the land. And there's this soldier standing there with a sword. And he's like, Who, whose side are you on? And he says, hmm, bad question. The question is, whose side are you on? That's Austin's fair phrase. Okay? All right. He's like, whose side are you on? Because I'm the, I'm the angel of the Lord's army. What we realize is okay. All right. And then he says, Yahweh spoke to me. And so he calls him the commander of the Lord's army. And then he says, when the guy speaks, this human looking figure speaks to me, it was Yahweh speaking. What's happening? This is confusing. It's confusing. They're trying to create shell space. Now, the Old Testament or the New Testament writers, they got all this rolling in their head, man. They know all this. All right. It's all up in there. Now, let's go back to Mark chapter 1. All right, we've made it back to Mark chapter 1. Whew. Okay, we all good? Y'all follow me? We tracking? And nobody said anything. I'm really nervous now. <laughs> tracking? Okay, so not only, not only is, is this happening, but the prophets talk about it too. And listen, if I went to all the texts in the Old Testament that do this, do this type of action where it's like the angel of the Lord and then Yahweh speaks and it's like this, here's... And, and then it's a man as well. It's it's incredible. It's loaded, 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 loaded with it. Okay, it's all over. So it's not my point. In telling y'all that this is not a New Testament concept. It's not. It's not only a New Testament. It doesn't just find itself and establish itself in the New Testament. No, these New Testament writers they were living in this. They had this picture and this framework from the beginning. Okay, all right. Now the second thing is that I want us to realize is that the prophets talk about it too, which gets us to Mark chapter one. So what we're going to look at real fast is indicators uh, that Jesus is Yahweh. Indicators that Jesus is Yahweh, okay? So none of these things are like, this is the one. Well, there's a couple I would actually say, yeah, that's like, boom. Lay on that one because you can't dodge it. But all of these things play into what the, old, the, the New Testament writers are type, typing, in, typing into. All right? So here we go. All right. Mark chapter 1. Open your Bibles. Look down there. All right? So what... What Mark does is he says, I'm going to tell you about the, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Okay? So the question is, all right, I'm with that. 
What does this mean? And then he goes to Isaiah. And we're like, what are you going back for? This is, this is a story about Jesus. Jesus is not Isaiah. Why are we going back to that? He has a point. Okay, so he doesn't just go back to Isaiah. He goes back to Malachi as well. The first, verse 2 is uh, ripping off of Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. And then verse 3 is ripping off of Isaiah 40, verse 3. Okay, and so what it talks about is there's this messenger who's going to precede Yahweh coming. So you go back to Isaiah and you read this and Malachi. Who shows up after the messenger comes? It's Yahweh. That's the word that is said. It's Yahweh. It's this. It's the covenant keeping God. It's the one that they worship. The one true God. It's Yahweh. It's Yahweh. Okay. The voice crying out in the wilderness. Prepare the way. And he uses the word right there. Prepare the way for the Lord. You know what he uses there? Kurios. The Greek word kurios. Which I just showed you. If you if you remember all back in the slides. Uh, is the word that Yahweh is translated into every time. Actually, 6,000 times in the Old Testament. So, my point here is Mark is not confused about what he's saying. When he says, I'm going to tell you about, I'm going to tell you about the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then he goes to Isaiah and says, there's one in the wilderness who's praying the way for Yahweh to come. And then he goes to who? Who shows up in verse 4? John. Who is John? Okay, the analogy, follow the analogy that Mark is trying to communicate to us. The analogy is this. John is the one who is preparing the way for Yahweh. Right? So, in those days, you go through this whole thing where it's, you know, John's in the wilderness and he's wearing camel hair and all that. He's eating locusts like a crazy man, but he's speaking the truth and he's, and he's testifying to the Lord about who the Lord will come he says, I'll baptize you with water, but one who's coming, Holy Spirit. Okay? So now we've established. John is the one who's preparing the way for who? Yahweh. Which is translated, Kyrios. So it's not God, it's Lord. Okay? That goes all the way back. It's Jesus God. The, the question is answered by the New Testament writer who says, yes, Jesus is Lord. Yahweh. Okay? Alright. So, and then, verse 9, in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth. All right, we're just introduced to this guy, Jesus, okay? Came from Nazareth of Galilee, was baptized in the Jordan by John. As soon as he come up out of the water, listen, he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending down on him. They're not confused about the Spirit. This is Yahweh descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. All right, so you have the Spirit present. Now you have this voice coming from heaven. And what does the voice say? You are my beloved son, with whom I'm well pleased. You have Jesus. So you have a voice from heaven. You have a dove, a, a voice coming down like in, in the presence of a dove. And you have Jesus. Guess what you just had? Yahweh. You have Yahweh. So is Jesus Yahweh? Yes. But so is the Spirit. And so is this voice that comes from heaven. Really challenging to figure out. So yes, when people ask the question, is Jesus God? The answer is yes. And the New Testament writers were not confused about this. They're clearly, Mark is showing us in his way, in the Hebrew way of literature, to show us exactly who Jesus is, who he believes Jesus is. This is Yahweh. He is Yahweh. Another thing that points to it is the virgin birth. Then, I don't, I'm not even going to go into the virgin birth. We'll probably talk about that when it comes to the uh, incarnation. We'll talk about the humanity of Jesus. So, but all of these things begin to overlap, like, like good doctrines do. They should all interconnect and intertwine. So we'll, we'll kind of we weave in and out of some of these as we go. But then, what happens is in Mark's gospel, and, and, what, and the reason I went to Mark is because what we believe is Mark and authority, which means it came first. Mark was the first gospel written, and then Matthew and Luke riffed off of Mark uh, and used him as an example. Okay, I'm teaching y'all all kinds of stuff right now. You got that? Y'all follow? We, we still, you still with? Yeah. Still with? I'm going to get to the why it matters. I'm getting to why. And you should be feeling why this matters because when the question is brought to you, we should have a defense. When it is said, Jesus never claimed, claimed to be God. It, now you know how to how to show them wrong, wrong. And I'm going to show you some other texts as well. There's lots of things that are indicators that, that Jesus knew what he was doing, the New Testament writers, they knew what they were doing. They were not confused by this. So 
right after this happens, right after this happens, and you see Yahweh come, John is the messenger, and he is to usher in Yahweh, and then we see the baptism of Jesus, and we see Yahweh three and one right there. So Jesus is Yahweh. But then what happens immediately is Jesus goes around doing Yahweh stuff. That's the best way to put it. He goes around doing stuff that only Yahweh in the Old Testament is credited to being able to do and does. Like right out of the gate, chapter 2. He, he forgives somebody of sins. He's like, your sins are forgiven. But mm, no, that's that is Old Testament. Read the Old Testament. That is only allowed by Yahweh Himself. What's Jesus doing? Well, yep, me and him. I'm Yahweh. I'm not saying he's the Father. I'm saying that the Father, Son, and the Spirit are Yahweh. Okay? These are, and there's Old Testament framework, as I've already explained to you and left out the hundred and some other text, to show you that there is this multifaceted one God, the Shema, that the Lord God is one, absolutely, but yet he's a man at this time, and he's the angel of the Lord, and all that, okay? So what's, what's happening here? So he casts out demons. Cast out demons. Your sin in Mark chapter two, verse five through seven. See in their faith, Jesus told the paralytic, "Son, your sins are forgiven." Man, eh, no, this you know, like what, 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 what? All that's what all the Pharisees are doing right there. All the Bible teachers, all the guys who really, really know the Old Testament real well, they're like, "Yeah, put the brakes on." What are you saying? What are you saying? Then he goes around casting out demons. I mean, listen, that's the Yahweh thing. Only one who created them can cast them out of anything. He raises the dead, the resurrection, and we can, God, the list goes on, right? Like, I don't have to go through those. If you don't know some of these lists, you can go back and listen to multiple messages that I've preached over the last, like, year, and you'll find all kinds of these stories. Because we always come back to Jesus. Now, John chapter 8 is a huge one. John, I, I, let, I did minimal on John because we're going to hang out in John when we get to the incarnation and talk about the Trinity. Because he, John's like, he's the dude, okay? Like, he's figured it out, all right? He's like, Riffing off the Old Testament, doing all this crazy stuff in Revelation and all this stuff, and he's got, I mean, he's got, he's got no one. Okay, he's figured it out. Okay, and he's, and he's really, really creative in how he explains all of these things. But John chapter eight, John chapter eight, verse twenty-three. Let me show you something here. This goes back to the I am statement. Remember, I said you, you have you have the burning bush. Moses goes to the burning bush. And the angel of the Lord speaks from there, but he calls it, says Yahweh is the one speaking. So it's Yahweh speaking there, and Yahweh gives the name, I am the I am, or I am of the I am, I am what I am, that whole, that whole thing. Now, when you get to, to John chapter 8, verse 23, John chapter 8, verse 23, I'm in Luke, that's why that doesn't look familiar. John chapter 8, verse 23, says, you are from, this is Jesus talking, you are from below, and I'm from above. Mm. You are of this world. I'm not of this world. Does he seem confused here? No, sir. Jesus is speaking very directly. Therefore, I told you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he. Okay. If you go back and look in the Greek set to again, to the word I am, when the Lord Yahweh speaks it at the burning bush, it's the same exact word used here that Jesus uses. And he uses it again in chapter 8. Uh, in verse 58 Jesus said and truly truly I tell you before Abraham was I am so, so listen this is like listen I'm Yahweh this is what Jesus is saying here he's not messing around he's using the same exact words it's very clear this is why after this point they're like homeboy's got to die we got to kill this guy because he's, he's claiming to be Yahweh that's not okay so why it matters remember People are coming at this. Josh said this in a prayer this morning. Josh said this. He said, this is probably the chief doctrine that the enemy wants to attack. Because if he can dislodge Jesus as Lord from your mind, eventually it will dislodge from your heart. And this is one of the main strategies in our day. People will say this. Yeah, but Jesus never claimed to be God. Yeah, but the New Testament writers, man, they didn't really think he was God. They were using kurios, which is not really, that's a word for any God, which is true. However, the way the Greek Septuagint uses it, which is what they would have grown up using, they know exactly what they're doing. It's not confusing with a little stuff. 
Jesus is the Son of Man, Matthew chapter 26. He says, you have said it. Jesus told him, but I tell you, the future you see, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power coming on the clouds of heaven. This is um, the, uh, the Sanhedrin is asking this question. Are you the Son of God? And how Jesus replies is, I am the Son of Man. Now what they would have, here we go, where they would have went is right back to the Clyde riding, the, the, the Clyde riding um, Son of God, the Son of Man, that's from Daniel chapter 7. When they heard Son of Man, they would immediately, it, it was a strange thing, but Son of God can apply to any, any um, kingly line of David. Anybody who was in the kingly line of David could be referred to, and is referred to in the Old Testament as the Son of God. However, there's only one who is referred to as the Son of Man. And that is the Daniel 7 cloud riding character who comes and is given all authority on heaven and earth. And he sits on the throne in heaven. And so, strangely enough, the claim to be a son of God is not necessarily as crazy as claiming to be the son of man. However, as the New Testament writers take this idea of the son of God and they realize who Jesus really is, that he is Yahweh, then they use that as, a, as an image for him to be to, to talk about him as that second person of the Trinity, divine. Okay? Son of man, you're the God, he's the Messiah. I'm the Messiah figure from Daniel chapter 7. This is what he's saying. So the question is, the question is not, is it is there some way that a divine, that divinity can become a human? Because we've already seen that. We have framework for that in the Old Testament. The question is, is Jesus that? That's the question on the table. It's not a New Testament concept. It's a framework and shelf space that was developed in the Old Testament. And the question we have to answer is Jesus that one? Is he the one? Is he the divine one? And Jesus refers to Yahweh as Father. So here's another indicator. Jesus constantly refers to Old Testament. Ten times there's a framework for Father. Uh, but it's always as the Father of a people. It's corporate. He's the father of Israel. Never is it personal. Jesus comes on the scene and says, he's my father. And makes it personal. And then the New Testament writers take that. They're like, boom. They begin, and that's how they refer to, to the, maybe you could say the voice in the heaven. And they begin to refer to the father that way in the son language. So they take this and run with it. Furthermore, the centurion. So this is not just Hebrews. The Roman centurion at the cross, you know, Jesus dies and earthquakes and all this craziness happens. It's pitch dark. And you know what the centurion says? Surely this is the Son of God. Now, he's not confused what he's saying either because Caesar claimed to be the literal Son of God. And he's saying, nope, not the Caesar that I serve. That guy who was just put on the cross and died is the Son of God. He's the true Son of God. The centurion is another indicator. And then all throughout the, the New Testament, okay? They, these writers, they, they write about this. Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 3. I told you, we're running. It's so good. And I know I'm a nerd, okay? I hear you. I hear you. I hear you right now. Gosh, what's this guy talking about? These things, these things matter. And we should at least have some, some and try to have some ability. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 7, verse 3. It says, without father, mother, or genealogy, having neither beginning or days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. So this one, so that Jesus, he didn't have no mother and have no father. He existed from the beginning, okay? He existed from the beginning, no genealogy, but yet he came as the Son of God, the kingly uh, line of David. So he looked like a, a kingly king from the line of David, but yet he preexisted all of this and he is a priest of eternal value. All right. The writer of Hebrews is not confused with the divinity of Jesus and the deity of Christ. Paul, Colossians chapter 1, verse 7. General Electric Power Company. That's how you get through Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. All right. You're welcome. Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, verse 17. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might be uh, might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased 
to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth, things in, uh, in heaven, making peace through the blood shed on the cross. So who, who are we talking about here? This is Jesus. Paul is not confused about the eternality, the divinity of Jesus. All right, and then you go to Revelation chapter 22 and how this... This member, this library, this library of books, how it ends, telling this one story, getting to my man uh, Jesus always, and beginning and end, Genesis or Revelation chapter twenty-two, verse thirteen. Look, I'm coming to you, and my reward is with me to repay each person according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. That's who Jesus is. That's who Jesus who, who do you think John thought Jesus was? Divine. He is deity. He is Yahweh. This is the way he thought about it. I give you one more. Just read the book of Jude. This is Jesus' brother. The last person on the earth who wants to confess that Jesus is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the divine, the deity of Christ, second person of the Trinity, Yahweh, is the brother of Jesus, right? Can you imagine having to admit that your brother is that guy? Come on. And what does he get to? He says in verse 4, For some people who are designated for the judgment long ago have come in by stealth. They are ungodly training the grace of your God into sensuality and dying, Jesus cried, Christ, our only master and Lord. Curios, the word translated for Yahweh. Now I want to remind you, although you came to know all these things once and for all, that Jesus saved the people out of Egypt. <gasps> Who saved the people out of Egypt? If you go back to the Old Testament, it's Yahweh. What Jude just did was he connected Jesus and said, Yahweh that was working back there, that was Jesus. Whew. Jude, his brother, is not confused. All right? He's not confused. So, there you go. That's as much as I can give you in, I don't know how long we've been, but this is, now I'm back to why does it matter? Why does all this matter? Some, some would just jump straight to, because of the functionality in it, it creates this process of, of this uh, of salvation or understanding of, of this, this system, this systematic theology that we have. It, it frameworks, and it does do that. It does do that. But that's not the first importance. Go dive into systematic theology. Try to figure out how all this works together and how it points to the salvation that we have. Most importantly, what this does, the divinity of Jesus holding this doctrine, the deity of Christ, what this does for us is it reveals the character and nature of God. The fact that he's transcendent, he's He's, a, he's out above. He's, he's other than all of creation. But yet he's imminent. He's within it, yet distinct. He's in his creation, but he's distinct from his creation. Don't get that confused. Think about this. Deity, as the Hebrews said, took the form of the Son of God, meaning person in the line, lineage of King David. That is the type of God that we serve. He is so driven to pursue you relentlessly that he was willing to, and now we're jumping into the incarnation, but take up humanity, divinity in humanity, so that he could be with you There is no God, no Elohim in any religion that is like that. The reason we hold so tightly to the deity of Christ is because it tells us the character and nature and otherness of our God in comparison to all the other things that are worshipped. There is none like Him. Chew on this. The word in the Old Testament meditate means to chew on or mumble to yourself. This is something you should mumble to yourself and chew on over and over and over and over and never leave this reality that the character and nature of God is one that is for others. He is seeking you. 
We want to explain and define the functionality of the deity of Christ. So many people are so consumed with that. However, before the deity of Christ creates any functionality or process or legal result, it shows us the character of God. It shows us the character of Yahweh. The reason we want a process, a system to align to is because we want to remove the relationship from it. Oh, if I got this system, this process, then I can just walk in this system and process, and it's all good. Me and God's going to be good. That's called legalism. That's fair saying. God, first and foremost, wants a relationship with you. Now, I've discussed this a million times, but I'll say it again. Relationships have boundaries and guidelines. For me to stay in relationship with my wife, there are some things that I have to do. So that doesn't mean you just throw it all out and, oh, I get to do whatever I want to do because I'm following Jesus. I'm in relationship with Him. No, no, the legal is fool. You know, and we know, all relationships have boundaries. But yet, still, it's there where we experience the character of our God, His relentless seeking after people. That is His character because this is what we believe here, that God is most glorified by His love. He is most glorified by His love, His relentless pursuit of humanity. So much so that deity would come and become a human and walk around so that he can be with us. He's never given up on the whole goal of humanity and creation, which was to reign and rule with them in the garden. And he will restore that. And he did it through Jesus. And he's continuing to do it through Jesus. So the question is, is Jesus this divine one that we see in the Old Testament? Jesus sure seemed to think he was. All of the New Testament writers seem to think he was. All of the early church affirmed that he was. The question is to you. I told you why it matters. First and foremost, because it shows us who God is. What he's like. So, you, you want a system, they want a process. No. They're not of first importance. When you make the word out to be a system, you miss the relationship. The point is this. God with us. God with us. God with us. The way the New Testament writers say it, the Lord with us, Yahweh with us. Kurios with us. And they knew Jesus was that when they walked with him. Now they wrestled with him, tried to figure that out, and doubted it at times. They didn't walk perfectly. Jesus made it clear. And then in his resurrection, he's, he, he, he's, he signed that check. It's past. It's good. It's good for him. Jesus' divinity shows us the humble, other-seeking nature of God. This is why this doctrine is important. This is why I would go through all that nerd stuff to get us to this. It matters. He's a humble, other-seeking God. And you know what people in this world think? That he's evil and domineering and does evil things. So that's another reason it matters. we got to be able to communicate to others the God in whom we know in relationship with. Jesus of divinity shows us God is most glorified through his love. So here we teach the Bible, biblical authority. And I just tried to model that for you. The best that I could. Biblical authority. You come here, we're going to read the Bible literary, literally and literarily. Because it is a form of literature. Hebrew meditation literature. So we're going to do both of those things. Josh, you can come on up here. Worship band, come. Last, bottom line, if you don't walk away with anything, if you lost all the Hebrew and the Greek, that's fine. The deity of Christ reveals to us the God who is loving towards his creation and relentless in his pursuit of people. us. The deity of Christ reveals to us the God who is loving towards his creation and relentless in his pursuit to be with us. That's why we hold on to this doctrine. It's a non-negotiable for us. That's good, isn't it? God is good, isn't he? He's given us a, a, 
a library of books that we call one book because there's one unifying story, Jesus. And it all culminates and finds its truth and reality in the end. So my question to you is this morning. The New Testament authors believe that he was Lord Yahweh, ultimate authority. Jesus said, I am. And then the New Testament authors also say this. To be saved, confess him as Lord, ultimate authority. Do you believe that he's Yahweh? Do you believe that? That is the question, isn't it? So I ask this opportunity, as they see, to receive him as that Lord. If you don't know him already, and if you're if you're in relationship with him already, then praise God. I pray that this deepened your understanding of him and your relationship with him. To understand his character and nature, that he is a God relentlessly pursuing you to be with you. He's going to extreme measures to make that happen. He's worth, he's worth worshiping. He's worth following. He's worth giving your life to. He's worth being with, which is his whole purpose, to be with you. Let's pray together. Father God, we love you. Lord, we thank you for your word. It's beautiful the thing that you have given us that communicates your who you are and your character and it's amazing I just love love your word and that's why biblical authority is, is the number one core value here I pray that the people are helped I pray that this sinks in they have an answer to why does this matter why does it matter if Jesus is God I pray they have an answer for that now as we interact engage a world who is in need of you a culture who is desperately in need of you Pray that they can give good answers to that now. And know that as they speak about these things, as they speak about your word, your presence is right there making it known. In Jesus' name we pray.